afternoon. It's hard betting close up here after so many excellent speakers before me, but I hope we'll keep you interested with, uh, with the content. Um, this is going to be pretty much the same presentation I just gave at the Yankee Dental Congress, but that was a three hour format, so I've had to eliminate a lot of stuff. Uh, since I'm going to be sending you the CD with all of the material, I've eliminated most of the, the scientific backup for these points and are just hitting the main points, but you'll have the opportunity to see those on the disk itself as, uh, as you sign up that list. So again, what we're going to no lavalier mic, tight here. What we're going to be talking about is microbiological risk assessment, particularly contrasted to traditional clinical assessment of periodontal diseases. But first, I want you to reconsider why does the average patient go see their dentist? And it turns out that it's for cleanings and checkups and that sort of thing, but less than 1% uh, go to see their dentist because of a gum or periodontal problem which is an astonishing statistic when you think about it. Only 0.6% of people are going to see their dentist because of gum problems, yet we know they're widespread, why so few? And when we look at the insurance claim data from the insurance industry, we find it roughly parallels the reasons why patients say they're going to the dentist. About 3% of all insurance codes submitted for, for repayment are on periodontal codes, which is a small percentage, the rest are for restorative and cosmetic and other procedures that you do. Just 3% for, for para. So we know that's consistent with why patients are presenting to dental offices. So the question is, why so little interest in perio? Well, here's one of the big reasons, of course. Every night, people get bombarded with advertisements for Listerine and other mouthwashes that show nice little animated cartoons of it killing the bacteria, and everybody is pretty sure that Listerine is going to do the job for them. So they don't have to ask you about periodontal disease. They know it's under control because they're using a mouthwash. It's your job to disabuse them of that notion, and how are you going to do it unless you provide them with compelling evidence that Listerine isn't doing the job? Other reasons, historically, Perio has never been viewed as a profit center in offices. It's kind of the, the, the backdoor thing, the, the, the loss leader to get patients into the practice so you can do real dentistry. And another reason is that it's time consuming. It, it, you're not doing crowns and bridges when you're talking to the patient about Perio. And another unfortunate reason is that a lot of periodontists traditionally have discouraged GPs from doing their own Perio because they want you to be the the dental equivalent of barefoot and pregnant when it comes to perio. You know, as soon as you see perio disease, refer it out to them because they're the experts in the field. And they do have more training in perio, that's true, but it's largely in the surgical management of the disease, not in preventing the disease. So we're going to be talking more about that. One last factor is most of you have had comparatively little training in perio compared to the other aspects of dentistry. I did some research with the American Academy of uh, American Association of Dental Schools, and it turns out that out of a four-year average curriculum, which is about 5,000 clock hours of education, only about 6% of that, a measly 300 or so hours, including both clinical and didactic coursework, is devoted to perio. So small wonder when clinicians get dumped out into the real world, you know, perio isn't the first thing on their mind, and they're not as confident of their perio skills as they are other aspects of dentistry. How prevalent is periodontal disease? Well, according to the largest study that's been done, the NHANES study by NIH, three out of four people have some form of periodontal disease, and that's defined as two millimeters or more of attachment loss. You'll see other numbers bandied about, but they all uh, depend on what is the measure of attachment loss. I saw one study that defined the measure as seven millimeters of attachment loss, and guess what? They found very little periodontal disease in America. Well, we can just legislate disease away by this method, you know, define it as nine millimeters, and nobody will have any disease. But two criteria are needed for periodontal disease. First, you must have a pathogenic microflora. You cannot have destruction associated with gum disease without having pathogenic microbes present. The other factor used to be called a susceptible host, but this is wrong. There really isn't a susceptible host in periodontal disease, because if so, you have to argue that three out of four people have a genetic susceptibility to periodontal disease, and we know that's incorrect. So what is it besides the old concept of susceptibility? It's simply a negligent host. It's people who are not controlling the microbes that are in their mouths, 
and allowing these bugs to grow, which triggers the series of changes I'll be telling you about that result in clinical disease. So once those bacteria are present, once the patient allows them to grow, then you have an explosion of the pathogenic organisms. They are sensed by T cells in the body. They trigger the whole immunological cascade that results in the production of, uh, of proteins that will dissolve the collagen in the bone. And that, of course, is clinical periodontitis. Why do implants fail? Most people think it's because it's a bad implant. I was at an implant meeting last spring and walking around the exhibit hall, and the exhibitors were busy convincing all of the attendees that the only reason your implant failed is because you weren't using their implant. And most people <laughs> seem to believe that. But implants fail for the same reason that natural teeth fail. Only about a third, 30% or so of implants failed because of mechanical reasons, bad occlusion and, and that sort of thing. The rest of them fail because they are colonized by the exact same bacteria that we see in ordinary run-of-the-mill periodontal disease. So about three out of four peri uh, implant failures fail for the same reason as natural teeth. The bacteria don't care whether it's a, a natural surface or a titanium surface, and the idea of using all these special plastic instruments because you can't scratch the titanium, it'll cause more colonization by bacteria, is, is pure hogwash. The bacteria couldn't care less. Transmissibility. You guys will have no problem with this. A lot of GPs do have trouble accepting the fact that they're dealing with a contagious disease. These organisms are not found in neonates. They are not found in the air, food, water supply. The only known reservoir is the sulcus of other human beings and some animals. So they have to be transmitted from one to the other. If we're not born with them, we have to acquire them. If if we talk about the common cold, which is a, a transmissible disease, at any given time, if, if you have 100 people, would you expect to have 70 of them having common colds? You know, the, the extent and, and, and pre, uh, prevalence of periodontal disease in this country is, is simply enormous. Saliva is thought to be the major vector for transmission. And you've heard of grandparents, you know, wetting the pacifier in their mouth before they plug it into the baby's mouth. Boom, they're infecting them. You share utensils that have remnants of saliva on it, you're infecting them. You share any kind of saliva, and you can think of lots more ways than I've mentioned, you're going to be transmitting organisms from one to the other. So, what are the characteristics of the microflora in healthy people versus periodontally diseased people? In health, the microflora is essentially non-modal, formed mostly of coxae and rods. In disease, there's a shift in the population of bacteria that are present. And you find spirochetes now dominating the population along with modal bacteria. In health, most of the bacteria are gram positive. This is just a stain that about half of bacteria will stain for and half won't, but healthy organisms typically are gram positive. In disease, there's a shift in the population to predominantly gram negative microbes. Healthy microflora is essentially aerobic while well, a diseased microflora is essentially anaerobic. And let me take a moment here to redefine what microbiologists mean when they use the terms aerobic and anaerobic. It doesn't mean that something is killed by exposure to oxygen. <clears throat> Pardon me. What it means is it, it describes the, the maximum optimal growth potential for those organisms. So aerobes grow best, grow fastest, when they're in a relatively high oxygen contrast. And I define that in the oxygen that we're breathing in the air, it's about 20, 30 percent, something in that range. If you stick a micro, microprobe in somebody's mouth, you usually get about a 5 percent level. And oh, thank you very much. Um, and if you stick a probe down into somebody's sulcus, the oxygen tension there is approximately 1 percent. So that is an aerobic environment for an oral bacterium, about 1 percent. When that environment is not changed and scrubbed and hygiened on a regular basis, that oxygen is used up and the titer lowers and it begins favoring the growth of the anaerobic bacteria. These are bugs that grow in sub 1% levels of oxygen and we divide them into obligate and facultatives, but essentially it's a difference in the concentration of oxygen. Question. The question was, the difference between gram-negative and positive, it's just a staining thing, yes. And lastly, 
there are a relatively sparse number of white blood cells and healthy microflora and too numerous to count in disease. Well, you'd expect that. I mean, if we're dealing with an inflammatory disease, you would expect to see an abundance of white blood cells when the disease is active. Periimplantitis and traumatic occlusion, exactly the same microbiology that we see in health, gram-positive, aerobic species for the most part. In most implants that fail, however, it's the same as infectious periodontitis, gram-negative anaerobic bugs. These are some of the species that are typically associated with health. It's really not important you know them all. These are the types of species that we see associated with periodontal disease. And the only non-bacterial one on this list, of course, is the fungi. They by themselves can provoke the immunological changes that we see in disease. And mostly you see this when patients have been treated with systemic antibiotics that wipe out their natural bacterial competitors. The three bugs that you see on the top of the list are the only ones that you might want to commit to memory. P. gingivalis, Tenorella forsythus, which used to be Bacteroides, and Treponema species altogether. There's some 57 species of Treponema, the spirochetes. They're all considered to be pathogens. And their relationship to disease is so profound that Sokransky, when he did a literature review of all the microbiological studies on disease, he said that these three always appear. I mean, they're, they're like obligate to be uh, periodontal disease. Some few exceptions, but these are always the key factors. And he nicknamed them the red group. He color-coded all the risk of the bacteria, so for red, orange, yellow, and so forth. These are the worst of the worst. You didn't think you're going to get a course without a pop quiz, did you? What do you think these microbes are? I'll tell you. Nobody likes to volunteer in big groups. These are yeasts. Yes, somebody said it. So these are the singular exception to bacteria being a, a pathogenic organism. All by themselves, they can cause periodontal disease, and that's the way they typically appear under a microscope. They're often termed a super infector. That doesn't mean they're a bigger, bad, or bug. It just means that you remove their competitors, and now their growth is unrestrained. So how do the bacteria actually attach to a tooth surface? Well, you start off with what are called planktonic microbes. These are free swimmers, individual microbes moving around, you know, in whatever environment they have. As soon as they find a substrate, and by the way, biofilms are not unique to dentistry. They are commonplace throughout nature. You've probably read about them being a problem in dental water lines, for instance. But if you have a creek or a, a pipe or, or any place where there's a water surface interface, you're going to develop biofilms. They are, they are just well adapted to create those. So these plantonic microbes, they find a substrate. They immediately begin attaching to it. In only a matter of minutes, they can switch on and off the appropriate genes to change their metabolism to take advantage of that substrate. And then once they go into their growth phase, they start differentiating almost like tissues, and I'll go into that in a little bit on the next slide. The concept that microbiologists use to describe this phenomenon is called quorum sensing. Bacteria, once the density of their neighbors reaches a certain point, send out chemicals that literally switch on and off genes in other species, not just their own brethren and, and same genus species of organisms. They will turn on and off genes in related species. So they begin specializing. Some of these bugs uh, assist primarily with the transport of fluids in and out through the channels in the biofilms. Others will, will help with the attachment. Others in repelling uh, invaders. Intact biofilms, for instance, are 500 times more resistant to systemic antibiotics than a dispersed planktonic community is. So some of those bugs are doing, you know, a Herculean job, job in, in protecting the interior bugs on the surface of the biofilms. Then they go into a growth phase where the bugs grow both laterally and vertically, forming mature colonies. And they're, they're not in a static fluid environment. There's curricular fluid flows that are moving along past them that exert a shear force on the biofilms. And so that will eventually detach daughter colonies that go on to colonize other sites. And here's just a little animation to kind of crudely give you an idea of what's going on. Whoops, maybe we won't have it. Well, it'll be on your discs. <laughs> so after the growth phase, we go into the uh, dispersal phase and the generation of the daughter cells. 
And I think I have a neat video for you that you're really going to enjoy here. Oh, before that, this is another way of looking at it. This is an artist's rendering of a biofilm in detail so that you can see, I'm not used to their cursor. Let me get my own. So you have the initial planktonic microorganisms colonizing to surface, growing laterally and vertically. Microchannels are formed within the, the matrix of it. Daughter colonies shut off with the shearing forces of the curricular fluid flow. Why would there be channels within the biofilms? And this is for transport of, uh, of nutrients to the bacteria that are more inner in the structure of the biofilms and getting rid of their waste products. It's no different than if you want to build a high density city, you typically build it on a river so that you've got a constant fresh water supply and a way to get rid of your waste products. This is a photomicrograph of stained particles moving through the microchannels in a biofilm. So this gives you a much better idea, I think, of what's happening on a, on a cellular basis there. And then the dispersal phase begins, and that's propelled both by the internal growth of the biofilms and by the shear forces of the curricular fluid flows. And this is really interesting. This is not real time. It's sped up a little bit, but biofilms actually move along the surfaces of the teeth. They're, 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 it's like uh, maybe a good analogy is a sand dune. It advances across the desert by the action of wind, in this case, by the mechanics of the shear forces. We are going to be trapped in this slide, I think. Uh, the, the primary is the shear forces of curricular fluid flow moving lateral to the biofilms. Just going with the current. Going with the current. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy the next hour of watching this. Uh... <laughs> and here is a vastly enlarged blow up of a single colony and the shear forces involved in prying off the, uh, the excess growth. And we may watch this for another half hour. <laughs> How fast do bacteria grow? Nobody really thinks about that. We can put them in a petri dish and watch how they grow, but that's not what happens in the mouth. There's competitive forces and nutrient problems and uh, a lot of other factors. And it turns out there's no good way to measure how fast they grow in the mouth. But a researcher at the University of Michigan, Dr. Walter Loesch, figured out an elegant way of calculating the rate of growth based on other things that we can measure. And what he looked at was the total biomass. There are, believe it or not, microbiologists who spend their time harvesting all the plaque off the surfaces of people's teeth, drawing it and weighing it. I mean, grad students, this, this, grad students probably, right? <laughs> and it turns out that, that once they do that, they can calculate how many microbes are in a gram and how many grams they have and conclude that at any given time, we probably all have about 20 billion bacteria in our mouths. That includes not only the teeth, of course, but the, the uh, cheek surfaces, the dorsum of the tongue, and all the other oral surfaces. 20 billion. We also can measure how much saliva people swallow every day. And now we can measure the bacteria in that saliva, and you know that that's being replenished all the time, so we can now back calculate from our original 20 billion bacteria how many we swallow, how many must be replaced. And it turns out that the answer is about every 4.8 hours. So this is a number you can take to the bank and use with your patients too. So every five hours, the number in the bacteri of bacteria in the mouth double. Now think of some of the consequences of this. If you have a patient who goes a day without brushing, that's 24 hours. Divide that by five, it's approximately five. So you now have two to the fifth power more organisms there. That's two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, times two, 32 times more bacteria in a 24 hour period if they don't do their hygiene. So that doesn't make somebody want to start brushing and flossing their teeth. I don't know what will. 
They grow a little more slowly uh, in the mouth than they do, well, a lot more slowly, actually, in the mouth in a petri dish. In petri dish, they'll reproduce about every 20 minutes. They don't grow that fast in the mouth because of the competition of other species and the problems of getting rid of their nutrients and waste products. Tissue invasion. Some of the pathogens, periodontal pathogens, are capable of invading the tissue. Why is this important? It's important because even if the patient's hygiene is, is idyllic, if they fall down on their hygiene, these organisms can reemerge from the epithelial tissues and recolonize the tooth sites. So it's probably going to be impossible to ever con absolutely control periodontal disease to the extent that one treatment, you'll never get it again. Because you always have the possibility of being reinfected from transmission and reinfected from your own organisms that are tissue invasive that come out again when the opportunity favors it. Contrary to popular belief, and you guys will have no trouble with this, this one gives most audiences real trouble, but this, it's not that the bacteria are doing the damage. It is our immune systems that are doing the damage. It's been calculated that we would have to have 10 times more bacteria than we have, 20, 10 times more than the 20 billion, in order to account for the tissue damage we see in disease. So what else is causing it? Well, it turns out that it is inflammation through two mechanisms. The first is passive, and I'm sorry I lost my slides illustrating this, so I'll, I'll try to describe it in, in words. We have, uh, our thymus gland is making T cells all the time, and they're, if I can use an army analogy, they're kind of the scouts of our immune system, and they're distributed throughout the body. In the gingival tissues, when they encounter pathogens that have been activated by macrophages, sorry, um, they're activated and they then circulate to the spleen and the lymph nodes, and there they, they have a convention of their like T cells, and they come to an agreement as to what are the antigens that are present, and that then triggers the bone marrow to begin making white blood cells specific to that particular bacterial antigen challenge. So the bone marrows begin gearing up and producing large numbers of these specific white blood cells, and when they get into the circulatory system, they get delivered to the gingival tissues, and polymorphonuclear white blood cells are amoebic. They can move around on their own, just the way amoebae can. They're not just passively carried by the bloodstream. So when they get in a tissue that's got the right chemical messengers, they squeeze out through the endothelial walls into the tissue, where their primary job is to digest the bacteria. But they don't. The bacteria have won this battle already. They have out-evolved us. They have figured out mechanisms for shutting down the ability of the white blood cells to phagocytose and digest them. We know now that some of these bacteria shut down the actual phagocytotic ability of our immune cells. Some of them have interfered with the chemotactic mechanism, so they, they can't figure out what direction the right chemical signals are coming from, and probably mechanisms that we haven't yet discovered. But the, the, the important point here is that we make all these white blood cells, we ship them to the site where the, where the enemy is, and they don't do anything. Now, the problem with that is white blood cells only have a three-day lifespan. So during that three days, they're supposed to be using up all these potent digesting enzymes that they're carrying, killing bacteria. Three days later, they die, the cell lyses, and all of those enzymes are now dumped out directly onto the periodontal tissue destroying them. So 50% is passive death of our own white blood cells that have not successfully phagocytosed target bacteria. The second half of the destruction is an active enzymatic pathway. The T cells are still hanging around, and the message that they're telling the immune system is, I don't care how many white blood cells you sent to the battle, you know, we're not winning, you know, ramp it up. So the body obliges by producing even more white blood cells. But now it has a problem because you can only get so many white blood cells to the site via the existing capillary network. So it needs a better roadway. It needs more capillaries of the tissue. Where to build them? There's already connective tissue there. So the body begins energizing collagenase and osteoclasts to break down the connective tissue to physically provide the room for a denser capillary bed to deliver more white blood cells to the site of infection, which die in three days and release their enzymes back on the same tissue, so it, it, it's a circular process. The more we try to fight this disease, the more destruction we do to our own tissues. Fortunately, it's a fairly slow 
uh, acting process. It, it's not an acute inflammation. So we can go for years and years before we see, you know, dramatic results from periodontal disease, but it's ongoing all the time. And unless we can shut down the way the immune system works, which nobody in the right mind wants to do, you'll die of the next hangnail you get, the only successful strategy for, for combating periodontal disease is to remove the triggers that start this whole immunological cascade in the first place. So that's why controlling the microflora is fundamental to diagnosing and treating periodontal diseases. And periodontal disease is in good company here. There are lots of diseases, at least 40, that are now classified as autoimmune diseases along with periodontitis. In fact, they are now the third leading cause of death in the United States after heart disease and cancer as a group, not any one autoimmune disease. So the proper way to start thinking about periodontal disease is just as you would diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, type 1 diabetes. These are all inflammatory diseases, and the functional mechanism of the destruction of the tissue is identical to that in periodontitis. I'm belaboring a point here, so I'm not going to uh, spend any time on it, but you're all well aware of the systemic connection with periodontal diseases at this point. The list just keeps growing and growing and growing of diseases whose, whose severity and, and prevalence is, is markedly greater if you have gum disease than if you don't, and by some very large odds as well. As you'll see on the next slide, lung cancers. 36% greater risk of if you have periodontal disease. Kidney disease, almost 50% greater risk. Pancreatic diseases. Leukemia and myelomas, I mean, these are life-threatening diseases. 30% increased risk if you have pre-existing periodontal disease. So it's not just dentistry. This is fundamental to the health of your patients. Why the linkage? Nobody is entirely positive, but the leading theory at this time seems to be that if you have a pre-existing infection in one place in the body, an inflammation, the body's immune system is heightened alert. It is ready to go into action quickly and more profoundly if an infection occurs someplace else in the body. So that's why a pre-existing inflammation for, for one tissue is increasing your odds for others. And there may be other reasons as well, but that seems to be the major thinking now. So, drop the word plaque. Plaque is, is a lousy term for descri describing what we're dealing with in terms of disease. It's a biofilm. All biofilms are not pathogenic. It depends on whether particular pathogens are present in that biofilm. It's inflammation that does the damage, and periodontal inflammation substantially increase the risk of medical life-threatening diseases. Now, that we have a better understanding of what periodontal disease is and the mechanisms of destruction, let's re-examine how we go about looking for periodontal disease. Are the traditional tests, periodontal probing and bleeding points and radiographs, capable of telling you whether this is a healthy or a pathogenic microflora? Can they predict which sites are going to go on to lose attachment and which aren't? Are there better tests available? Isn't it really time we started moving beyond a notched metal stick to diagnose inflammatory disease, or plastic ones. <laughs> okay, I'll see the point. <laughs> but this is hardly 21st century dentistry. This is certainly not 21st century medicine. We know from the statistics that I showed you earlier that only about 1% of patients are presenting for periodontal problems, but we know in the average population group, including patients under care, for every 1,000 people, 145 are going to have severe periodontal disease, greater than 3 millimeters loss of attachment. Another 228 will have early or moderate disease that can be diagnosed microbiologically. So that's a total of about a third of the patients in the average practice already have periodontal disease and are in need of therapy. And I ask you, what is your detection rate with the current tools that you're using in your practices now? Are you finding disease in about one out of three patients? Because it's probably there. Yeah. You are. Well, right on. <laughs> Good for you. 
Historical legacies were all developed prior to the realization that we're dealing with infectious disease, inflammatory disease. They were never intended to detect those. They measured what could be measured. And we're talking here, uh, let's see, about disclosing solution and plaque indices, about radiographs, about BOP, and pocket depths. And I'm going to talk about each of these in more detail here. First, disclosing solution. What are you disclosing with disclosing solution? Super gingival biofilms. I almost said plaque. Super gingival biofilms. These are, rough, are always aerobic and gram positive. They're not related to disease. Now, you might make the argument that if you have a, a, uh, a pathogenic flora above the gum line, or even a non-pathogenic flora above line, that there may be bad guys living below the gum line. But you don't know that for sure. And there are ways of establishing that now. For motivation purposes, yes. Staining the teeth, you know, can, can help motivate patient. As a diagnostic tool, it's worthless. Radiographs. What are we measuring when we look at a radiograph? Historical damage. The disease already has to have progressed to the point that you've lost attachment for you to detect it on a radiograph. So it is what is called a lagging indicator. This, this, this is after the fact. There's one exception, and that is if there's an intact lamina dura on the radiograph. So if you have a well-defined lamina dura like here, the odds of more breakdown happening in that bone are about uh, zero for the next 12 months or so. If there isn't an intact lamina dura, all bets are off. You just don't know what's going to happen at that site. So the bottom line on our secret cow of pocket depths. The pocket is not the disease. It is an artifact of the disease. And yet, periodontal probes are designed to detect what? Pockets. They're designed not to detect the disease, but to detect an artifact. And conversely, shallot sites are not protective. Now, you all know this in, intrinsically, but you don't think about it. So let me, let me phrase it another way. When you're, you know, a teenager, a young teenager, you don't have pocketing around your teeth. So the disease has to start at shallow sites. It doesn't start in the deep sites and the flora magically materializes after the site gets deeper. The flora precedes the loss of attachment. So this, because you have a, a patient in your office with nothing deeper than a two and a three, doesn't mean they're not at risk. And those of you who are already doing microbiological testing in your offices know this because you've seen patients who look clinically healthy who already have a pathogenic microflora. And that gives you the opportunity to be truly holistic dentist and that you can go in proactively do something before the disease becomes advanced and isn't that what we all should be doing and conversely deep pockets can be risk-free and that's less common but sometimes we find five six even seven millimeter pockets that are no longer pathogenic and they tend to be stable over time and even regenerate bone but the difference is what's the flora that's present there bleeding on probing Boy, is this a tough one if there's a crowd of hygienists. <laughs> you just cannot criticize bleeding on probing. I mean, this, this is in their, in their genome, I think. <laughs> Studies, though, ad infinitum, this one by Boyan is just one of the classics in the literature, have, have, have conclusively shown that bleeding on probing is not predictive of anything. You can look at baseline stats for BOP and down the line compare whether they're still bleeding, whether they've lost attachment, no relation. None whatsoever. What about as a predictor for caries? I don't have any data on whether or not they predict caries. Sorry. Not my field. Bleeding on probing, however, is not correlated with periodontal disease. Why? Because it seems such obvious, you know, if they believe they got gum disease. Maybe, maybe not. And here's why the maybe not. Because there are confounding factors, one of the biggest of which is the probing force. And it turns out that the ideal probing force is in the range of 15 to 25 grams, lower than this slide shows actually now. And how many people probe with that, that modicum of pressure? In fact, you can guess the answer from the way I'm phrasing the question, what does the average periodontal probe weigh? 15 to 20 grams. So how many of you, when you're probing mandibular teeth, just, you know, lightly rest the probe into the sulcus and see how far gravity, you know, pushes it down? You, to the degree that you apply additional force, you're over-probing the pocket. Question? Also, it's the angle. Absolutely. 
Yeah, the, the, the comment was angulation. This is another huge problem with periodontal probing. But the force of the probing is a big one all in its own right. If you're going to probe, get yourself, you know, a, a better probe. I, I'm no great fan of probing, but, you know, there are better probes than manual notch sticks. You can get electronic notch sticks. Drugs and hormones. What the patient is currently taking uh, systemically can affect their bleeding in the mouth. I can guarantee you in a reproductive age female population, we can find 100% periodontal disease as long as we test at the right time of the month. The hormones will make the tissues much more uh, likely to bleed. Local trauma, this never happens in dental practices, of course, but it's rumored that some patients, you know, go home the night before and just brush the hell out of their gums and the teeth, you know, in an attempt to persuade you that they've been doing this since the last appointment. Well, their gums are going to bleed more the next day. This one fascinates me, unconscious expectation. So you get the patient in uh, six months since the last visit, and you look on their, whoops, you look on their chart, sorry, um, you look on the dental chart, and there was a four millimeter pocket on tooth 18. And so you get out your trusty notch metal stick, and you go into that pocket, expecting to find what? A five millimeter pocket, of course. And you don't think about it in conscious terms, but subconsciously, you know, you keep increasing that pressure until you discover that fifth millimeter. So it becomes a self fulfilling uh, premise. So all of these factors. Taken together, question. I absolutely would, and, and you're you're anticipating a slide that's coming up. <laughs> yes, all the time. Yep. So bleeding is not correlated, and talking about specific drugs, about a quarter of the adult population is now estimated to be on um, blood pressure medications of various types. Guess what side effects all of that class of drugs have in common? They all increase capillary fragility. They thin the blood in some cases. So naturally, you're going to have greater tendency towards bleeding on probing. Aspirin and NSAIDs, a single prophylactic dose of aspirin a day will increase bleeding on probing by about 12.5%. How many of you are including this in your health histories? Not that bleeding on probing matters, but, you know, if you're interested in seeing why it's bleeding, it might be useful to know whether or not, you know, they're taking aspirin or other drugs. So, I've laid it out here in a chart here that I think will dramatically bring home the, the, the problems. Studies have shown that if a site bleeds when you probe it, 30% of the time it's not disease. So that's a false positive. So about one out of three times when you probe and you find blood, that bleeding is not due to gum disease. But the flip side of the coin is the more serious one. How many false negatives do we get? In other words, the sites that when you probe do not bleed, so you assume they are healthy. It turns out that almost 90% of those sites already harbor pathogenic microphores. And you miss that entirely with notched metal sticks and gushing blood. So, summing up, pockets are not the disease, they are the result of the disease. Shallow sites are not protective. Deep pockets can be risk-free and stable. And I mentioned before, if you're going to get a probe, get yourself a good one like the Florida probe. Here's an interesting question. When you probe a site, how many bugs stick to that probe as you go to the next site? Ever thought about that? Turns out, it's quite a few. A million. Now, I wouldn't get too upset about this and start, you know, beating yourself up bloody about all the disease that you've helped further in your careers because these bugs are modal and you saw the nice uh, uh, photomicrograph of the shear forces moving these guys along. They are more than capable of moving along and colonizing sites all on their own without your help. Still, it's interesting that a million bugs are on the end of that probe when you take it out of the pocket. Measurement error. This is another problem with probing. Lots of studies with calibrated and, and, and uh, uh, periodontists who have been uh, intergroup coordinated as to their probing forces. When they turn them loose on populations of, of, uh, of patients and they compare the probing results, they usually don't match. 
it turns out that there is a standard deviation of the error in reading a notched metal stick. Let me put it to you another way. Uh, we have a periodontal probe and it's got the traditional one millimeter markings on it. What if we put markings every quarter of a millimeter? Wouldn't that be a more accurate probe? And the answer is no, it wouldn't be. It's immaterial how close you put the markings on it because you can't read changes less than two millimeters according to all the studies that have looked into this. The official Academy of Periodontology position on the subject now is that the change in attachment has to be greater than two millimeters from the last measurement to be of any statistical significance. In other words, the patient has a four millimeter pocket, they come into the office, you probe them, and it's now a five millimeter pocket. Have they lost a millimeter of attachment? You don't know. Maybe. There's just no way to tell. It, it's, it's beyond the limit of the confidence of, of a millimeter stick. It is the change in attachment over time that has significance with regard to probing. If the change exceeds two millimeters from visit to visit, that is statistically significant, and you can take that to the bank as far as uh, deciding which way the case is going. But again, it's a lagging indicator. The bone and tissue changes aren't going to change until after the damage has been done. So that's my summary on notched metal sticks. Interesting woman named Mar Margaret Wheatley uh, published a book, and uh, smart woman. Uh, she, the basic premise that, of the book is we manage what we measure. And translating that to dental terms, if we only measure pockets, depths, and bleeding, then that's what you're going to treat. And that's what dentistry has traditionally done. We measure pocket depths, we treat to reduce pocket depths, we measure bleeding, we treat to stop bleeding. But that's not the measure of disease. Those are all lagging indicators. If we want to start treating infectious disease, you have to start diagnosing infectious disease. You need better tools. And fortunately, there are a bunch of them, and I'll be covering them for you. Um, one of the few studies I left in here, and you'll get all the studies in, in your disks if you want us to send that to you. Uh, it's conclusive. It, it's, it's well established in the literature now that there are bugs that are associated with disease, and whether they are present or not predicts the future course of that disease. Genco a luminary in, in the periodontal research community, all the way back in 1986, said that even though we don't know all of the bugs that are involved in periodontal disease, we know enough about them that we should start using it as a diagnostic test. This is 86. We're talking 24 years ago now? In fact, I was so struck as I was reviewing uh, the data putting this presentation together that I put a, together a little timeline. Nine years after Jenko said that, the Academy of Perio, almost a decade, gets finally around to saying that, well, maybe in refractory disease, finding out what kind of bugs there might be useful. Possibly useful. Four years later, McGuire published a study in J. Periodontology saying that, let me quote from the bottom of this, it's assumed for clinical decision making that regardless of the composition, all plaques do the same thing to the patient and that patients respond in a uniform manner to any kind of plaque. The profession abandoned that concept years ago, but we continue to use it as a traditional basis of disease. And it's still true today. He said this in 1999. Periodontology 2000, one of the truly great uh, periodontal journals. Um, article by Hafeji and Sokransky. Again, came to the conclusion since then, evidence for a number of species, including these are some of the ones on Sokransky's red group, uh, and spirochetes has gotten stronger, not weaker, from Jenko's day. Another three years later, the AAP finally comes out and says that susceptibility to disease is highly varied and depends on the pathogens that they have. Well, duh. <laughs> but why did it take so long to come to that conclusion? particularly valuable in establishing the end point of therapy. So it's not only a diagnostic tool, it is a, an end point tool. It tells you when you have done your job and have arrested that infection in that patient and there is a, 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 a scant likelihood that they're going to go on to lose attachment. Finally, 
last year, you look at the data and the majority of dental practices in this country are still trying to use notch sticks and blood to diagnose a periodontal inflammation. Why? Come on. Standard of care, yeah. Inertia. I think we're going backwards. What's happened here? We are going backwards. Okay, we're caught up now. Here's the main reason, which is related to the standard of care. It's a tradition. That's the way we've always done it. Well, that's no reason to continue doing it that way. If we always, if we continue doing things the way we've always done it, every one of you would be in this picture. So what are the tests that are currently available to you? There are several on the market. The first one available was cultures. And there are two laboratories in the country, you'll see their names in a moment, that can take your sample of plaque, biofilm, <clears throat> that's harvested with a paper point, and you send it off to the laboratory, and they will proceed to culture out the significant pathogens that are there. God, why did I ever <clears throat> accept an offer to lecture in the desert? Well, okay. <laughs> Microidet, this is a DNA test. There's also one available by a company called Oral DNA now out on the market. It's now possible to chop up all of the biofilms, send them off to a lab, and they can extract the fragments that are associated with pathogenic bacteria. Genotype, this is a test for human genetic risk. It turns out that some population group are at a much higher risk of getting gum disease because of their genes. This is particularly true in smokers, by the way. BANA test, this is an enzymatic test. It turns out that the three members of the red group have a, a unique peptide on there that is singular just to those three bugs and no others. And there is a test now available to see whether those three bugs are there by their enzymes. And lastly, phase contrast microscopy. You can actually see the differences in pathogenic floras versus healthy ones with a chair-side microscope. Let's talk about them individually. Cultures have the advantage of being able to speciate. They can tell you the genus and species of the bacteria are there. I don't know how important it is to be able to name the bugs, but they can identify the ones that are associated with pathology, or at least about nine or 10 of them typically. One very useful thing that cultures do, though, is they test for antibiotic sensitivity. In other words, at the same time they're testing for what bugs are there, they're putting them out against a panel of antibiotics. And they will tell you, for the bugs that this patient has, what is the best antibiotic or combination of antibiotics to get rid of them. They can give you the relative proportions. The disadvantages, it takes two weeks to do the test, plus the time in between. Some of the bugs don't even start growing on a Petri dish until day 13 of uh, culturing. So it, it does take a bit of time. Uh, in warm weather, if you live around here, yeah, you gotta send it overnight by Federal Express to the services because they're heat sensitive. It costs about $120 per test. And there are some pathogens that they can't test for, in particular the spirochetes, but both of the labs that do culturing use backup tests to detect whether spirochetes are there. One lab uses microscopy and the other uses a DNA test. The two culturing services that I would recommend to you, the one on the East Coast uh, is in Philadelphia. Uh, it's the Oral Microbiological Testing Service and that's their telephone number. Again, this will be on your CD. And for you West Coasters, the closest lab is at USC in, in Los Angeles. And that lab is run by Dr. Jorgen Slots. If you're going to be sampling for culturing or um, for DNA testing, there is one thing that, that you really need to know, and that's that it matters where you get your sample from. You need to insert that sample to the full depth of the pocket. The apical third is where the most pathogenic species are going to be. So if you just partially stick it into that pocket or the paper point bends and isn't going to the full depth, you're going to get a distorted view of which species are present. So you need to insert it all the way down. DNA testing, 
The biggest one that was on the market was the Micro Ident Plus. It tests for all members of the red group, plus about eight additional pathogenic species that aren't considered to be as dangerous, but still are classified as pathogens. They also can infer antibiotic susceptibility based on the, uh, the literature current on those bugs. And they give you neat little charts that you can put in your patient's record. Uh, it takes four to 10 days to get your results. When you take the test, it, it's, uh, it goes to a US point that overnights it to Germany, and then the results are emailed back to you. Costs $89 per test. And this is what one of their reports looks like. So in this particular one, they've identified that, well, let me explain first. This baseline here would be no risk. Anytime any of these bugs is elevated above that line, that's periodontal risk factor. If it is elevated above this dashed red line here, then that means the numbers are so great that a systemic antibiotic may be indicated for those uh, particular patients. So in this particular report, they were very high for AA. By the way, AA has been downgraded in microbiological circles. It used to be thought to be a, a pre predominant pathogen. But more recent data show not nearly as important as some of the others. But these members of the red group here, Orphomonas gingivalis, Tanarella, Forsythus, and all the Trepanema species, those are considered to be very risky pathogens. So it was positive for two of those and also positive for one of the orange complex bugs. Um, genetic susceptibility. I mentioned that this is especially important in smokers. Smokers, just because they smoke, will have about a three times greater risk of periodontal disease than non-smokers. If they smoke and have a genetic defect in the genes that code for interleukin, then the risk goes up to seven times. It's double what it was if they don't have those genes. And what defects in the interleukin gene do is they, they result in an overproduction of interleukin. So if interleukin is abundant, then you have a much more rapid and profound response to bacterial challenges. So these people, yeah, they're at much higher risk. The advantages of the genotype test, uh, you can find out who is at risk and who isn't. It looks specifically at interleukin-1 dysfunctions, can pick out those smokers who are at particular risk. Same disadvantages as the microident test in that it takes four to 10 days to get your results. It costs $89. And probably many of you already know all of these things, but interleukin-1 is like the master inflammatory compound in our bodies. There is almost no function of the immune system that it isn't involved in the regulation of. So it is fundamentally important uh, to the expression of the disease. And I won't belabor the points of the individual ones. This is the enzymatic test called the BANA test. Advantages of the BANA compared to culturing and, uh, and genetic testing is this is a chair side test. And this little gizmo is about, and doesn't show up that well on the projected slide, um, but it's about the size of two packs of cigarettes. So it's very small. Uh, it's a test strip type test. It tests for the three members of the red group. It can't tell you which is there, but it doesn't really matter which is there. Any one of those three species uh, is pathogenic. It takes just five minutes for the machine to process the sample. And it's fairly inexpensive. The gizmo costs, um, sorry, that's a, that's a typo on there. It costs $500, not four and the individual test costs six dollars each. And of course your results are immediate. Here's how the test actually works. Uh, you harvest your biofilm with a small curette or, or there's a use for your notch metal sticks. You can use that to go in there and get the biofilms off the tooth. You smear it onto the lower half of the test strip. Most people will sample the three deepest pockets of record and that way they, they are guarding against false, uh, false negatives. Because if you sample the three deepest pockets and all of those are negative, the likelihood of shallower sites being positive is pretty small. So you lightly apply it to the test strip on there. Moisten the upper half of the strip with a little bit of distilled water. It's perforated. You fold it at the perforation. And then you insert the folded strip into the processor. This is the generation one of the processor. After that, it's automatic. The machine compresses and heats the sample to the, to the best temperature, and a little light and a buzzer goes off at the end of the cycle to let you know when it's finished. 
you pull the strip out. And one intriguing idea, I just heard at this meeting, instead of your opening up the strip, give it to the patient. Let them open up the strip. There's nothing, you know, magic about it or anything they can do wrong in it. That makes them a participant in the process. And that's not a bad idea. The lower half is, is superfluous at this point, and you're looking for a color change on the upper half of the strip. In a weekly positive sample, you will get a slight color change. It will be grayish and relatively small points on there. If it is a strongly positive result, you'll see a, a distinctly bluish color to it, and there'll be much more of it on there. So it's semi-quantitative. Uh, the, the depth of the color and how widespread that color is corresponds to the number of organisms. The test is very sensitive. It's on a par with uh, DNA testing. It can detect as few as 100 of the 40 billion, 20 billion microbes that we have in the mouth. Question. I'm sorry, couldn't quite hear that. Um, the ALT has problems. I hate to say anything negative about that because we used to carry the test actually at, at Oratech. And we were unfortunately had to discontinue it because it wasn't correlating well with the other tests that doctors were doing. There are um, a number of confounding factors with the ALT test, it seems. It's been recalled. It's been recalled? Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> this doesn't show up on projection uh, videos at all I've seen, but take it for my word that there are distinct blue dots here. <laughs> I'm be looking at a blank sheet of paper there. Uh, but, but it's a, clearly a visual difference in, in the reactions. This, believe it or not, is the very first microscope ever. Most of you remember back from your school days that Van Leeuwenhoek invented the microscope. That's wrong. It turned out to be a guy called Jensen, and he was 100 years earlier than Van Leeuwenhoek was. Van Leeuwenhoek got all the credit, though, because he invented a better microscope, literally the better microscope, and that was his instrument. And the way it worked, it's kind of interesting. The art of glass making was still very primitive then. They, they couldn't make high quality glass, but they can make decent quality little glass beads. And that's what is right here. There's a little glass bead embedded in that metal plate. And you stuck your sample onto this metal spike here. It had a fully adjustable stage. You could screw this back and forth. <laughs> and you held it up to the sun and let the light come through the glass bead and you could see uh, uh, reasonably decent magnification, a lot of distortion, but you could see stuff. And what makes Van Leeuwenhoek even more interesting, he sampled his own, I don't think in his day they even called it plaque, but you know, he sampled the stuff on his teeth. And he describes, he kept detailed notebooks, he described the little animacules that he saw moving in the dental plaque. Let me move on to his next quote for me because it's really kind of cute. He said, Quote, I then most always saw with great wonder there were very many little living animacules very prettily moving. <laughs> Don't you just love the way they talk back then? The biggest sort bent their body in curves going forwards. The second sort off time spun round uh, like a top. I think he's describing spirochetes in the first one. That would be typical of the way they move. And in his day, they still had halitosis, of course, and the popular remedy at the time was uh, vinegar. Rinse your mouth out with vinegar. Acetic, it's going to kill bacteria. And he described in his notebooks that after rinsing with vinegar, that the animalcules fell dead forthwith. <laughs> <laughs> so he really should be credited as the first observer of chemotherapeutics in, in perio. Again, uh, scientific studies showing the relationship of um, spirochetes and P. gingivalis as markers for the progression of disease. By the way, I, I got a little extra time, I think. And this, this has nothing to do with the subject of the lecture, but it's interesting. Uh, besides vinegar, the second most popular thing for curing gum, uh, bad breath back in, in those days was urine. People would rinse their mouth with urine. Well, it's sterile when it comes out of the mouth, and of course it's highly acidic, so it does the same thing in terms of controlling malware. Creepy thought, though. Chair-side microscopy. This is something that you can also do in the office. It's very fast. It takes about a two minutes to, uh, to do. We can't tell you what 
species of bugs you're looking at with microscopy, but it does identify certain morphotypes that are unique to disease that you never see in health, like the spirochete uh, family of organisms. It also is hands down the best patient motivation tool for home care that has ever been invented, bar none. I know some of you use microscopes, I recognize in the audience, and I'm sure you wouldn't disagree with that. For those of you who have never seen what it looks like, I've lost my cursor, there we are. Here is a little uh, comparison in real time of what a healthy sample on the left looks like compared to a risky sample on the right. You don't have to be a microbiologist to, to see the differences, I and mean, they're profound. Even patients will be able to track these from visit to visit with no trouble at all. Disadvantage of the microscope. They're expensive in the way of instrument compared to the other tests. The other tests, you have no upfront equipment costs. With a scope you do, they typically range from five to $7,000 or so. The most popular, probably around 6,000. Uh, again, we can't tell you what antibiotics are good to use or not with a microscope. There's no way to establish that. It's a little unfamiliar to, to a lot of people. You don't use them in your normal day. And here's how it's actually done, though, since a lot of you may be unfamiliar with it. You select a, a new slide, never reuse them, handle them by their edges so that you don't get glove powder or any other things on there. Apply a drop of Oropep. Oropep is like an artificial curricular fluid, so it keeps the bacteria happy on the slide. And you just put one drop on the slide first. You can pool all your samples in the single drop. And again, like with the other tests, it's important that you harvest your biofilm from the apical third of the pocket. That's going to be the most anaerobic portion of the pocket. And if there are going to be pathogens present, that's where they're going to be. So that's what you want to look for. Uh, you want to avoid calculus in your sample because that will prevent the cover glass from seeding thinly enough. You then transfer that plaque to the drop of Oropep gently because there's information on the organization of the bacteria that's diagnostically significant. And I'll show you that in a little film in a second. Apply a cover glass. Just place it on the slide, let it drop down so you don't trap air on it. The sample's then flipped over and compressed. The thinner you make the sample, the sharper the optics will be. But even if you don't compress it, it's going to be sharper than Van Leeuwenhoek's scope. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> and the last step is you seal the slide. It turns out, just a, an accidental discovery that was made as people were using scopes, that the best time to examine biofilms is about 20 minutes after you put them on a slide. We're not entirely sure why that's the case, but about one out of three slides will look significantly riskier 20 minutes after preparation than looking at it fresh. So less chance to underdiagnose when you wait 20 minutes. And sealed slides will also stay alive all day long. So they're useful to take one on, on yourself, for instance, to show them what a healthy sample looks like. I'm presuming giving you the benefit of the doubt here. <laughs> and also maybe keep your first really active slide. Because, you know, even a healthy patient seeing their microbes for the first time gets a little freaky, but if you show them what real disease looks like, they're, they're pretty well relieved. So there's just a close-up of how our seal is applied. Nothing special about that. And you can look at all the spirochetes. They, they are very, pardon me, very distinctive on a microscope. Scopes also pick up uh, yeasts. They pick up trichomonads, which I'll show you in a second. They're interesting bugs. Amoebae and white blood cells. Microscopes are the only tests that can actually give you a window into the patient's immune system. If there are a lot of white blood cells present, too numerous to count, that's inflammation regardless of what else may be present in your sample. There's active inflammation going on. You can also see red blood cells, but they're not diagnostically significant. Here's what a spirochete looks like. Nothing else, no other genus, has this uniquely coiled shape to it, so they're very distinctive microscopically and they correlate higher than any other bug that we know of to the progression of disease. There are 57 odd species of them and, and they all look a little bit different, but there's a neat rule of thumb. It turns out that in, in the more aerobic of the conditions, the spirochetes that grow then tend to be loosely coiled, more like the one on the bottom, F there, 
So um, that's typically the kinds of spirochetes you would see in moderate gingivitis, say. As the area becomes more profoundly anaerobic and the population shifts to the more pathogenic species of spirochetes, you start getting these guys up here at the top. More coils, more tightly coiled, thicker, larger. Uh, so you can do a, almost a differential diagnosis of how long that biofilm has been there by the types of spirochetes that you see in the sample. And here's the way some of them can look under different techniques. Here's sort of a 3D picture of a biofilm to give you a better idea that this is a complex society. You know, they, 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 uh, it, it's not just random bugs there, they organize. I think you can see in this picture that you've got a long filamentous form here and little uh, short rods colonizing the surface of that. And because of time, I, I've got some even neater slides I could have shown you as to how these things build up sequentially, but that will be on your uh, CD. Here is, oh, geez. Is there any way I wonder we can turn the contrast down on the, on the video projector so it's not so bleached out? Because it looks great here. Something in the back says, no, it can't be done? Well, a little better.